It's going in five, four, three, two, one. It's going. Okay. And we are live. Hi, everybody. This Hi. is Vicki Cherry of the Sanctuary Radio Show. And I am happy to have you all here today. Um, I am interviewing my cousin. So this is my cousin, Mrs. Marguerite Bailey Young. And she is a longtime educator and um, one of the matriarchs one of the matriarchs of a line of our Bailey family. So welcome, Aunt Mar I call her Aunt Marguerite because I put respect on her name. So welcome, Aunt Marguerite. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Yes. So um, there's a lot going on today. So whenever I have a guest, I always ask them, how are you feeling today? The things change every day. So how are you feeling? I'm feeling well. I'm I'm doing very well. And, and you know, as far as health is concerned, and I'm feeling well about what's going on. So I'm okay. doing well. Okay. All right. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. So for those who are watching, this is my cousin. She's my second cousin. Her dad, and my grandmother, were brothers and sisters. So um she has a totally, you have a birthday coming up too, right? Yes. Okay. Tomorrow, Saturday. Saturday. Can we, can we share your age? Indeed. I will be 92 Saturday. Okay. So she going to be 92 Saturday, y'all. So she has seen a lot and she has experienced a lot and a, good, uh, and a lot of good wisdom on, on her line of the Bailey family. Everybody comes to her to ask for all of her wisdom and her advice and her help and her support. So Aunt Marguerite, can you tell us where you're from and sort of like how your younger years were? Yes, I, I'm from Accomack County on Virginia's Eastern shore. And of course, Wendy came later. <laughs> I came much later quite a few years later. Uh, we're, we're from the, the Eastern shore. I am the second in a family of eight children. And um, our, our mother was a homemaker. W with eight children, she, she had to be a homemaker. She did not go out to, to work as some of the women did at that, at that time. And daddy, with hard work and ingenuity and sixth grade education, over time, built a trucking business. And over time, he had five long distance trucks on the road. That means uh, traveling, hauling produce long distance with five trucks on the road at that time. So. Um, with eight children at home. All of us went through the public education in Accomack County. Mm -hmm. All of us had college education with master's degrees or, or above. And that's, that's okay. our family. Now that's amazing to, to know that all of your siblings, you and all your siblings were educated and masters and above and, you know, very, um, like breaking ground. So that's awesome. My mom is one of them. She's a cousin, but she also, she's more educated than me. She has a master's. I don't have a master's. So it's, it's important for education. So now, can you tell us about like, what was life, being what was life like being educated on the Eastern Shore? What kind of schools did you go to? What kind of teachers did you experience? On, on Eastern Shore, on Eastern Shore, one of the most fortunate things that I had was were they, they had good teachers. That was the thing. But in my community, there was a, a teacher, a male teacher who taught fifth, 
sixth or seventh grades. He taught us things that I got when I went to Virginia State. Oh, wow. He taught us a lot of stuff. He was one of the, he was respected by, by his colleagues as being well-educated and his children, I mean, the students from our community were the valedictorians at the high school. Okay. That, that, that's something. So uh, education was, was very important. Now, in our, in our family, education was very important. Granddaddy, our grandfather, says he had third grade education, but you would have thought that he, he had more than that because when I couldn't do algebra problems, word problems, I could ask granddaddy and he could solve those problems with arithmetic. Right. And problem, tell me how it's done. And I could put the algebraic expression and I could go back to high school and be the only one with the problem solved. And ah. algebraic expression. So education was very, very important in our family, but also in the community. Yes. Wow, that's awesome, man. And I'm thinking about, so like you said, I came much later. I didn't come till 1970, but I remember my granddaddy writing, who also was a long distance truck driver, who was your dad's brother. And um, he always had a long envelope. He had envelopes everywhere with all his math problems, figures he had going all the way down the page, calculating all the so very smart people, very smart people. Um, and so now I, I have some Virginia State University people on and Denise, Denise says, hi, I'm Marie. Do you hear, is it, is it a little glitchy? She's, cut, she's cutting off a little bit. Am I cutting off? That's right now. Okay. Okay. I can hear you better now. I'm Marguerite. Denise says, hi, she's watching us. And there's some other people on, and Virginia State is on. So what was it about Virginia State that lured you to go get further your education there? I know many of us gone, I'm from Virginia, I'm an alum too. Okay, well, let me tell you how I got to, how, how I got to go to Virginia State. Okay. The back in, um, in Virginia, I don't know about anywhere else, but in Virginia, if you were in black high schools, the valedictorian and the salutatorian would receive a scholarship to go to Virginia State. That's how I got to go to Virginia State. And so I was, I was an honor student at Virginia State. Okay. I had the opportunity to, to get a, a, a job. I worked in the office of the, of the minister, the minister's office right across the hall from the president's office. So I sat as secretary to the minister, I sat in the office with the secretary to the Dean, Dean Johnston, the Dean and vice president of Virginia State. Okay. Now at Virginia State, I, I majored in business subjects. Okay. And, and I do have to tell you that I, I joined the Student Christian Association. Well, I, you see, I, I work for the minister. Mm -hmm. And one of the major things that, that happened in the Student Christian Association, we, we invited white students to come to our school, come to, to, to the campus, the Virginia State's campus. Yes. And then we could not go to the white campuses. Mm -hmm. We were not allowed to go on white campuses at that time right and i can remember uh, uh, some of the students said that if their parents knew that they were on virginia state's campus they would be disinherited but they came and and we were all figuring out what we were going to do to change things and that's been a long time ago so now what year did you come out of virginia state uh, marguerite I came out in 19, January 1949. Oh, wow. Okay, all you Virginia. So we have Keith, 
Keith Bailey's on, Erica Garner's on, we got Virginia Heath on, and oh. we got Mrs. Mildred Grant on. They all say hi, Aunt Marguerite. Hi, hi to all of you. Most, <laughs> most of those are either my nieces or nephews or yes. something. <laughs> yes, yes. And so um, can you share with me about the importance because then you became you went to Columbia yes. to get your teacher certificate? Get your yeah. master's, okay. I got a master's degree at a master's degree at Columbia University. Okay. And I received any any certificates for administration and supervision and so forth at the University of Virginia. Now, now you when I came out and, and even some years after, we could not go to the universities. To, to get a, a master's degree, a white university. I couldn't go to Mary, I couldn't go to UVA or to William and Mary, but right. I could go to Columbia. And the state of Virginia gave us some money to go. Okay. $150. <laughs> okay. That, that's how much we got wow. to go to 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 uh, what wherever you you needed to go for higher higher degrees. Wow. Uh, and you had to find the money to, to go. To get the rest of it. Right. Uh-huh. Wow. So so it was it was very important. Education is very important. Uh, uh, and it's important that we have black educators. Children going to school even now, children need to see their teachers, teachers who are just like them. Yeah. So black educa educators are important as well. Yes, yes. Of course, it's important for children to see the white educators as well, because they're going to have to live in the world with everybody. Right. I agree. And so being a child of the 70s, I didn't have my first black teacher until I was in the fourth grade, but it was a male. It was Mr. Thomas. So that was my first black teacher. And then we had a few here and there, but of course, when I went to Virginia State, um, we, you know, our family, as you know, I'm talking to the, to the guests here. Um, we have a legacy at Virginia State. All of my mom's, many of my mom's cousins went there, especially for undergrad. And then I went there. And so I actually stayed in the same dorm as my mom did in Bird Hall my freshman year. And we also have a family endowment there too, which we can go into later because it still is um, highlighting the importance of education and having money raised to be able to support students to go. And then we have had many, many um, cousins past me who have gone, um, including your granddaughter, Bianca, went to Virginia State, yes. So, um, Tell us about life as you got older. So now you were there, you graduated 49. And so we are highlighting the time. We are marking the time. The time is we are in revolution again. We are fighting in the streets again. And we have had deaths of people at the hands of the police or even of the community again. So it's nothing new. You saw it in your time and we are seeing it again. Do you, so a lot of people are comparing George Floyd with Emmett Till and it took your master's degree, Howard University uh, grandson all this time to finally get in, but now he's in. So yo, I got your grandma here, uh, Brandon. So um, they are comparing it to Emmett Till. So you were an adult during that time. And that was one of the things that um, was, like a, was like an awakening. Even though black communities knew it was happening, they featured Emmett Till's mother, Mrs. Mobley, in like Life Magazine, in Ebony Magazine. She showed her son's body for people to see. So what were you thinking uh, what was the impact, if any, that that specific death in, I think it was 1954, had on you and your community? Well, 
that was, of course, most people, most of the black people were upset. We knew what it was like yeah. to, uh, for, for us to, to find something that we would all talk about. Well, this happened. And now we've got this young, this 14 year old being murdered, all of that. However, there were other things that, that occurred. Okay. Let me tell you about when I went to work, I yes. graduated in 49. Yes. And I got a job teaching in Emporia. And, and I, I started working, well, I could, I could take short, I mean, I could take dictation and, and transcribe. And so the NAACP lawyers would, would come, I would be the one. I'd, trans, I'd, I'd take dictation and go to the school and use, my, use the typewriters in the school because I'm teaching typing mm -hmm. and go and transcribe. Wow. Only that. Let me just tell you, you probably are too young to know that we were fighting all the time. To, to get to get to for black teachers to get the same money that white teachers were getting something all the time well at, uh, you you might know that schools in Virginia schools in Prince Ed, Prince Edward County Virginia got closed because a girl walked out of school the lawyer in Fredericksburg no the lawyer in Emporia was the one who did the grunt work to get that girl, for that girl to be the one to go out, come out. Okay. Well, when there were meetings in Dublin, there were a, there were meetings. Let's say lawyers, a lawyer came out of New York, a lawyer came out of Richmond, and and a lawyer in in, in uh, Emporia. I was the one taking the notes. Wow. And we were the ones who were seeing to it that, oh yeah, she, the school in Prince Edward County is gonna close. And so what, what are we going to do about it? But I'm taking the notes. So I'm always been involved in stuff like that. Yes. That's black things. But, but, but then when I, when I, all through that time, I was involved with, NAACP as well as black issues. Yes. So when I left there, it was nothing new for me to be involved. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> and and that's what I wanted to highlight. We have um during this time, so you've experienced it, your parents experienced it. I'm sure your grandparents experienced there was always something, you know what I'm saying? So I experienced it in the in during my time. My daughter is experiencing now who's a teenager, you know, so it's generational. And so I feel like this generation that is out now is called Generation Z. And Generation Z has a different mindset. Um, and they are more likely to fight, be disruptors, and they don't have the mindset of going to work for other people like past generations did. So they have a lot of um, stock in seeing this system crumble. And I have been to at least one um, protest with Sydney, my daughter, and I was so impressed and so excited by their energy and by their message. So I feel like we're in good hands. And just like, can you hear me, Aunt Marguerite? I can, I can hear you, but some words are dropping off. Okay. I'm not sure what it is, but just like in any army, everybody has a position. And, um, you know, some people belong on the front line and some people do the typing. And some people have the radio show. Everybody plays their part. So that's where we are again here. Everybody is playing their part. And um, I'm just glad to see it happening. 
on a show that I did two weeks ago, I had some more of our family members, the millennial generation Z, talking about their experience on the front lines, being out in the street. Deronda got tear gas, you know? Yeah, everybody has been experiencing this, but can you, can you share with us any um, thoughts that you have about this present day uh, revolution that we're in? Yes, I can. Okay. To, to start with, it takes the young people. It takes the young people to do it. Yes, they have different ideas, but you got to let the young people fly. And I say, yes, let them fly. Gently advise because there were times when we were doing things that the old folks wanted us to slow down, but gently advise them, but let them go. And I think this is the best thing in the world, what's, what's happening now that didn't happen before. And we were planning it when I was at Virginia State because we would have white folks coming and we were going to be doing these things together to make a change. But here these people are together, whites and blacks. I see those young people out there in the street, white and black, just as many whites as you see, blacks. And they're all young. Great, great. As long as they do it peacefully, peacefully, and they're not getting into, into difficulty that somebody is going to get killed or hurt or injured. That's, that's the thing. And I say to the old folks, let us help to, to encourage those young people. You've got to, you've got to let them go. I, I say, this is the best time in, in the world. What's good for what I see that's so important to me is that my, my young uh, nieces and nephews have their friends, white and white ones and black ones, and they're out there doing. And yes, keep on protesting. I say the way to make a change is to do something that's different. That's exactly what we did. We weren't out in the street protesting. Uh, we were not walking in the street but we protested the way we knew how. Yeah. And changes that we saw is because we did something. And now I'm 92 years old. And so you, I, I did stuff that was not necessarily what the old folks wanted us to do, mm -hmm. but had the, we had the courage to, to go to the Episcopal church, the Catholic church, not just the Baptist, the Methodist church down the street and get those folks, talk to them and get those folks working with us. Okay, you're doing it a little bit differently, but that's the way change comes about. And I, I am just as happy as I can be that these people, these young people are out there protesting and saying what they, they feel has been happening through the years. And, and things haven't changed fast enough. Amen, I agree. They haven't changed fast enough. And, you know, I wanted to highlight this one piece. You had a son and you had younger brothers and sisters and now you had nieces and nephews. We are always taught how to keep our hands in our pockets when we go to the store. How to don't act, you know, don't act silly in the store. I remember being in the Four Corner Plaza with auntie and grandmommy, and we went to Ellen Glick's store. They said, you and Amy stop that running around. I didn't even understand why, you know? So we have to message. So for anybody who is not in a black family, it is commonplace for messaging to be passed down through the generations for, for black people, black children to behave themselves to don't cut stuff in the store, 
to act like you have some sense. And these are things not because our parents um, were mean, these were survival tips. Yes. So can you talk to us about some of the ways that you navigated your son and your family members to be safe? And for the students that I taught, as yeah. well as students that I was in the schools that, that I was the principal for, or that I was the director of instruction. I became director of instruction for the city of Fredericksburg. Okay. And so it, 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 it fell my lot to be able to say to and to run workshops so that teachers and administrators would see the difference in what we had to do. Now, for, for us, uh, last Friday, let, let me just tell you this, last Friday, I was invited to speak at Market Square okay. for the city. And I was to tell my story. And just what you're saying is what I said to the folks there. We had more white than black. And I said, white families don't have to say to the, your children, don't touch it. When you go in the store, stay with me. You, the, the white children would be able to touch stuff and pick up things. But our children, we knew that our children could not do that. And Jarvis was sitting with me. Jarvis, my nephew, was sitting with me. And I said, he won. He, he's this one. Was, he, he would find his friends out there and he wanted to do whatever they had to do. We had to snatch him back. Snatch him back because he could not do what other kids were doing. And so we had to tell our children, uh, Make sure you, 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 you don't touch anything. Don't pick up anything that you're not going to buy. When you get to be a teenager, don't pick up anything that you're not going to buy. Yes. This is what you do if you're stopped by the policeman. Uh, be sure there are those things that we had to say to our children that did not have to be said to, to the white to the, that, that the families did not have to say to, white families did not have to say to their children. And so, and right today, where parents are having to say that just in case, things are not, haven't changed a whole lot. And so if they, if, if our children go out there and do some things, you'll watch, they will be treated differently from what will happen with white children and I became the principal or or above with lots of children more white than black and our children had to be told this is what you what you have to do back in the day back in the day uh, I guess you know right after um, Martin Luther King was assassinated we had those the, the, at, at the high school, the black children wanted to meet so that they could, you know, we didn't want them to walk out of the school. So we had them to meet, but, the, but we had some good thinking young black children, students, and, and, and they had me to be one of the chaperones in that meeting and a white coach. And those children talked to each other. And uh, all I could do would be to listen. I mean, what I did was to listen unless they asked me a question. And so you could see those children had been taught. There are some things that we, can, we have to do. We're going to have to do it this way if we want to get to do it their way. And I saw them, I saw them learn, I saw them follow, and they and and they were deciding among themselves how to stay in school, not walk out of the school, and 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 they're they're the right today, they are the elders in the community. Some of those children are the 
grown-ups in the community right now. Right. You you just just have to let the let the young people express themselves in some way. Let it be peaceful enough so that they don't get pulled over and treated by white officers the way that we don't want them treated. Absolutely. They, 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 need, they need to have that opportunity. And what I see happening today, Wendy, mm, when, uh, having those white folks going along with them, it's going to make a change. It's going to make a I agree. <laughs> and I'm very hopeful. I'm very hopeful for that. So can you share with us, because this has not changed also, being in corporate America or being or working for people, working in the school system or corporate America or in any business, um, Black people aren't always treated fairly. And in your interview from last week, you talked about, you know, that you had all the credentials to be a principal or to be in another school and you weren't given the opportunity. I just, these, these last few years, left corporate America because I was mistreated. And I said, I don't want it. But a lot of people can't leave or don't leave. So how did you navigate those situations of being underdeveloped, or underused and underappreciated all those years until you got the job you wanted? Well, that happens all the time. Yeah. I came to Fredericksburg, let's say in 1957. Now I had the same brains that I had. I had the same character. The, the same education, I, I got recognized as being a master teacher, <laughs> oh yes, but let me just tell you about that. When we integrated, uh, finally, see I taught for a number of years at the black high school. I was a good teacher then, and I was a good teacher when I left there. But here's, here's the thing, when we integrated, they were trying to, I taught the business subject at the black high school, all the business subjects and some English, okay? And that was a concern. What are we gonna do with Marguerite Young? You know, because I was the only black teacher, only business teacher at the black school. Well, our students were going to the white school, we integrate. Now, they had two or three, three business teachers already there. Well, we were getting some more students. What were we going to do with Marguerite Young? Well, there was some talk in the community. Well, they didn't know what they were going to do. Maybe they didn't need that another business teacher. What, what were we going, going to do? Anyway, I got, I kept saying I'd like to, to go. To, I, I want to go, you know, applying to go to James Monroe, teach business subjects. To the, to the high school to teach business subjects. And, and uh, at one point, I, I got an, uh, an appointment to be interviewed by the principal at the high school. Mm -hmm. There was a white middle school. Well, they, they, when, when we integrated, our school became a middle school. So I got assigned to teach seventh grade math and a, and a class called citizenship that we set up for overage children. And they were as many whites as blacks. In fact, more whites than black, but overage. Anyway, I got, an, I got an appointment to be interviewed at the high school. The middle school white principal said, Mrs. Young, the superintendent called me and, and wanted me to not let you go for that interview at high school. And I am not going to be a party to anything like that. Mm -hmm. Go up there to be interviewed, mm -hmm. come back here. Come, I'm gonna wait for you. I want to know how it went. Now, this is a white principal. Mm -hmm. and he, is the, he is the, probably the fairest white man I know in the city of Fredericksburg. Okay. So I went up there and I, and I had to, and they moved me all around. 
I went back and told the principal at the middle school, they don't want me at James Monroe. They don't want me at the white high school. But if I didn't care, if I didn't love what I'm doing here at this middle school, I will see to it that no more federal money comes into the school system in the city of Fredericksburg. And I can do that. <laughs> I, 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 I finally got to go over there. And that was because that middle school principal got to be the principal at the high school. Okay. And he, I'm still teaching seventh grade math. He walked into my classroom as the high school principal and said, I want you over, over at the James Monroe to teach business because I had been teaching seventh grade math and he was the principal at that middle school. Mm -hmm. I want you over there. I've got a, a young business teacher. She's not making it. She's going to be gone. I want you over there. This is the end of October. By the 1st of, of November, I was there teaching. I walked in that morning. I know he was pleased to see me. Ms. Young, welcome. Now, just keep up the standards of the business department. They had three business teachers. Okay, I was making that. I was going to be the fourth one. Okay. Okay. That end of that year, I said to him, Richard Garnett, don't ever tell anybody else that they have to come up. The rest of the teachers in the business department have to come up to my standards. They're not to me. Ask the students. Just ask the students. Right. <laughs> From that point, I, I got moved up. I got moved to assistant principal. I got moved up to different, different, different categories. That's how you do it. How do you get moved up? Do your stuff. Know the stuff mm -hmm. and do it. And you know what? If you're working in the in school system, your students will, will, will move you up. They're the ones. They thought I was pretty good. Uh -huh. they, I was the, the, they thought I was pretty good. And I got to be assistant principal. They'd come to me. They needed me. And then I got to be the director, the principal. They thought that was okay. I got to be the director of instruction. That's fine. And so if they needed my help, they got it. And that's it. That's what you do. That's awesome. Uh, Cousin Virginia said, tell it. She said, tell the story. So, um, so I, you know, I, I think everybody appreciates that. So now, how do you, how did you navigate it internally? Because sometimes it's painful when it doesn't feel like people appreciate your work. Can you hear me? You're, you're cutting off. Okay. But did you hear okay. what I said? I was like, how did you navigate it? Because it, it, it's painful to do your work at the best and people not appreciate you. How did you navigate that? Well, the, the thing of it, Wendy, is you, you have to remember where I came from and, and what was happening during those times. Yeah. You know, you, you, you have to know what you can do. You also have to know what you can do for others. Mm -hmm. um, when the time, when we began to integrate, it so happened that, that the, the teachers that got to teach the white students were the better teachers. And the students knew that, that that, that happened. And, and you don't get moved up, no matter, no matter that you don't move up or whatever, you don't get what you feel you deserve, but you, you know that if you keep doing it, something is going to change. Okay. And because we've been down, we've been down all along, a little bit of movement, just helps. A little bit of movement helps you. And when you get to a certain stage, somebody else recognizes. When people begin to recognize that you can do, um, they begin to appreciate it. Yeah. And 
always I have been working in the school system, in school systems, in small communities. The city of Fredericksburg is a, is a small city, okay? Mm-hmm. And, and when I first started out in Emporia, it was a small city. And, and folks get to know what you can do. But let me tell you something else. I also knew that if, if the kids think you're pretty good, you got, and, and they tell their parents, you got to get out there with the, in the community. I got out there in the community. The folks knew what I could do. Okay. I got called on all the time. Okay. All, all right. That's awesome, Aunt Marguerite. Well, you were interviewed last week. And when we spoke, you said there were a few things you forgot to say. Do you still have those thoughts that this like maybe a few things that you want to say in closing? Well, yeah, I guess, I guess so. Uh, I, I want to give an example. You know, I don't really know what racism really is. I do, yes, I do. I know what it is. Okay. I know how I feel. Yeah. And I call it racism. But I also know a lot of white people and they and I work with them. I believe that they, they don't even recognize that they have white privilege. They, they do not, I, I don't think they think it. Let me, let me give you an example of a, of a, school, of a, a school example. Okay. At, at one time, uh, when I was a principal, I was the one who was observing the teachers and evaluating them. Uh, I was the one going in those rooms and finding out. And when we were, and I was dealing with curriculum and instruction at that time, that, that was my assignment as an assistant principal, not, not necessarily discipline. But anyway, a young white teacher, we, were, we, we had gotten standards of quality from Richmond and we were looking at our curriculum in English to see whether or not we were in compliance and we were redoing curriculum for, for what the teachers were going to teach in English to be in compliance with the standards of quality that had come out of Richmond. And a young English teacher, white English teacher, was assigned to, to, to work with me a couple of hours, three times a week. Well, one day she had a, one day, uh, in her English class, in one of her English classes, two black students were playing with cards, you know, playing cards, decks of play. They were not sitting together. They, they were not bothering anybody. They were not disturbing the class. And two white boys were in the back of the room fooling around and playing with one of the school's machines. And they were laughing and playing. She sent the two two black students out who had playing cards on their desk. They were they were playing with the cards, you know. I don't know whether they were shuffling out loud, but she they were not disturbing. She sent them out. The the male, the black male, was angry. And and they were they were supposed to go to the other assistant principal for discipline. The the black girl stopped in my office. And she, she came in, she was angry, but she was hurt. Yeah. Said to me, Ms. Young, I, I know Ms. Moran, oh, I know this teacher is not prejudiced. I, I know she's not, but she was wrong today. She sent us out because we had the cards on our desk. We, we had the cards and fooling with those, but we weren't disturbing anything, but she didn't send those boys out. Okay, mm-hmm. I, when the teacher came uh, at her time to, to work with me on curriculum, uh, we talked about it. So I asked her, did you, you know, were the students, uh, were they disturbing the class? No. Were they doing what you wanted them to do? No. 
well, was there anybody else? She said, well, those boys back there playing on, on the, she named them a, the, a piece of equipment, but it was school equipment and I can't tell you which it was now, but she, she called what it was. So I, I said, okay, why did you not send them out? They were not doing, well, she thought that this is what they do, talking about the black students playing cards. So I said, they who? <laughs> uh, I guess that's what they do at home. They, okay, is they who do you think that these white boys uh, play on school equipment at home? No, okay. The difference is we talked about it. She, she could see that she had something in her head about what black folks did and therefore how she treated the students in her room a little bit different from yeah. what we teach uh, from each other. Right. She, she, maybe the black students are a certain way, but the white students a different way. And she could therefore, when I got through talking to her, she could see that, well, maybe I hadn't really thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. and that's what I have been doing. I'm going to try to be a little, a little bit more careful. Right. The truth is, they they feel that it's it's okay. This is the way that we need to treat these people. But I don't have to treat this group that way because at home they learn this way. This is the way I was taught. So that that. Um, I had to, we had to have some, some workshops at our school during that time. Right. We had, uh, when I became the director of instruction, we had to run some, some uh, uh, workshops as to how you treat people. What, and, and I could point out teacher by teacher, this Mr. This Mr. Birch, this is what you did right in your classroom. And I'm doing that in front of all the teachers. This so and so, this is how now. How could you do that better? Go through that kind of thing, and and what's happening is folks don't understand how it makes us feel yeah. when you treat us a certain way, but you treat other people in our presence a different way. Yeah, yeah, okay. yes. That that can be very painful. So. In modern terms, you checked her, Marguerite. You, you let her know, you gave her an awareness. We call it, you checked her. Yes, All right. <laughs> um, niece, your niece, Denise, your niece, Denise wants to know. You can only do that when you have a position of authority. Yeah. And that's what needs to happen. And, and I, I guess what happens is, you, you have to be better than, and when you were talking about uh, not getting to the position, you got to keep, keep trying, keep pressing, keep applying to get to a different position. And, and that, I think, of course, I'm not out there now, I'm not there, but I have a feeling, I have a feeling that it still, it still happens that a, that a black person has to be better than, and it has to, that black person has to be better than for a longer period of time in order to get to be, to, to get to be where they ought to be. Yeah. And, and that's exhausting. Yes, it is. It's exhausting. Yes. And so that I think is part of what the young people want to change. The emotional <laughs> the emotional labor that stuff has, it, it, it beats you down. After a while, it wears you down. So our um, Denise, your niece Denise is asking, what do you feel is your biggest accomplishment in overcoming racism? I, I, I don't know. I guess, I guess that 
having been having had the privilege of being in Fredericksburg for a long time, having gotten out into the have, having had uh, administrative administrative positions in the school system, and having been out there in the organizations in the city that folks began to see that I had something to offer. And so, Denise, I imagine, I don't know that it's an accomplishment or, or uh, st stupidity. People call on me all the time. Like the mayor calls me often. Should I do, how do you think I should do? And it's not just about black folks. I mean, she's, she's trying to figure out how she should do something. Uh, uh, what should she do to get reelected? Mm -hmm. uh, or whatever. I have people who call me a lot. I don't know whether that's an accomplishment, Denise, or whether it's, I said stupidity because I do get a lot of calls and I do get people to ask my opinion. I get people who feel that they should, that I should be a part of their campaign in order to get elected. That's not true, but I had one person some years ago who said, uh, look, you, I need you on, I need you on my side because you can command so many votes. You, you, that's not true, but they think it. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's just being here. I, I don't know really that I've had much of accomplishment. It, it's, it's whatever folks think you have. Maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe I it's both. think you have. I think I, it's both because you definitely have the experience. You have um, the credibility. People want to know what you have to say. And so we appreciate that. I would also add the next time they do that, ask for a consulting fee for your labor. So don't, don't give them free labor. No free labor. No free labor. If you think I can get you some votes, then pay me. That may be. Maybe that's that's what it is. I'm, I'm... <laughs> so we are going to close. We're going to wrap up now. Okay. Um, thank you for your time. We have so many people here watching. Um, Dwayne is here. Alicia is here from Fredericksburg. Um, and so they're all saying hi. They're all saying thank you for your uh, sage wisdom. Any last thoughts before we close? No, oh, and thank you, Wendy. Thank you, and thank you, all, all you, all you Baileys that <laughs> that are there. Yes. And I, I'm gonna say this: Jarvis doesn't want me to say it, but there are no dumb Baileys. All the Baileys are smart. That includes you too, Wendy. That's right. <laughs> I wear it. I hate it. Thank you for for this, and I'm. I'm just as proud of you as I can be. Thank you. Uh, I've got so many, and you know, it's, it starts with, with our old folks. Yes. If, if you, your, your grand folks were my grand folks, my yes. folks too. And they were smart, whether we, whether anybody, we had a great uncle, your great, great uncle that left home a teenager. When he came back, he was a medical doctor. Yeah. That that was during slavery time. Yes. I mean, just after slavery. So so <laughs> that's granddaddy's brother. Yes. I'm I'm telling you that that black folks have had have had the the wherewithal that folks didn't think that they that they had, but we've always had it. And now a few people are finding it out. Absolutely. Proud of you as I can be. And thank all of you for, for being on. 
I appreciate it. And I want to tell you something. You know, I'm too dumb to have a Zoom. So my nephew, Jared, so Jared is sitting right here. He had to set, he had to set up. She set up on her iPad now with her own Zoom. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jared. Oh, no problem. I, I have an iPad that I never have had used it at all. I don't Still know. in the box, brand new. She's had it for a couple of years, so set up now. Wow. But I decided to, to share my own with you guys today. I get to have all the time to myself. Yeah, at you, Brandon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Aunt Marguerite. And I do want to just take a moment of personal privilege as the host of the show. I have been seeing the words, and people have been saying out of their mouths the words white supremacy. So if you did not know, words have power. Words have vibration and energy. So when you say the word supremacy, that makes you feel a certain way and that gives a certain status that may not be warranted. So what I'm saying is for anybody who's listening, please do not use the word white supremacy anymore. And what I use is, and Aunt Marguerite may or may not agree, but we do agree on that she knew who she was. So that bolstered her to be able to navigate all of the things that were happening. But when you know who you are, and when you know who you are, and you know the sacrifices that were made, only people who are insecure put up barriers to stop other people from doing being the best that they can be. So consider for yourself, just consider switching white supremacy to white insecurity because that's what happens. Certain people, the more secure they are, the bigger barrier in front of you. So just think about that, but don't say supremacy again unless you're talking about yourself because just those words carry power and that's not true. It's not true. So thank you again. And I look forward to seeing you, everybody the next time in the sanctuary. Please share this good information with my cousin. She dropped a lot of good wisdom and knowledge on ways to navigate what is happening now. And uh, we appreciate it. So thank you, Aunt Marguerite, and thank you, Jared. Oh, you're welcome. You're All right, welcome. have a good one. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.